We're jumping back into the book of Acts, continuing that series in chapter 5. So for the astute kind of listener, that would mean that we've already studied chapters 1 through 4 in previous weeks. I know, though, for me, like when we're about to jump into something we've been out of for a week or so, it's nice to just remember what's going on in the text. So what's been happening before we just jump back in cold turkey? So let's do a quick recap this morning of just the first four chapters of Acts. And I'm going to seek to keep this very short and very sweet. And so if there were five words to summarize the first few chapters of the letter, what would they be? Here are the five that I would choose and why I would choose them. The first word is this, unity. So, so far in the book of Acts, there's been tremendous emphasis on the unity of the church in Jerusalem. They're living together, they're sharing meals, they're sharing possessions even, and they're even sitting together under the apostles' teaching. We see them actively putting off selfishness and seeking to care for one another. So when someone has a need, others are quick to jump up and meet that need. And although, you know, they were a very diverse group, people from all over, we see that they're operating with one accord. They're unified. And one of the things that they're doing when they gather together is actually the second word that I'd use to summarize Acts so far. It's prayer. The early church was a praying church. In Acts 1.14, it says, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. That's talking about the first 120 disciples in the early church. They were a church that prayed. And then, even after God amazingly like, expands their congregation by 3,000 more believers, here's what we read in Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And so even as the church is exploding in size, there are these key foundations that stayed with them. And a devotion to prayer was one of them. They recognized we are a needy people, And we need God. And so they brought their requests to him and their praises. Well, a third word that I would use to summarize Acts so far would be power. And not necessarily referring to the power of the church, but rather the power of God the Holy Spirit who is in and present with the church. In Acts 1.8, Jesus promised the disciples that the power of the Holy Spirit would be sent upon them. And when that occurred 50 days later on Pentecost, the course of history was changed. The church grew in mighty ways, and God did these miraculous events to help them understand that he was the one behind it. And it's that power that enabled this new church who was filled with all of these new believers to be unified and to be effective in its witness. Try to put yourself back into first century kind of mindset for a second. Imagine thousands of new baby believers in the same congregation altogether. How do you think that would go if God the Holy Spirit wasn't present in his power, right? That might've been a little bit of chaos, but they were unified. They were unified. It's also amazing to consider the transformation of the apostles' lives. You know, immediately after Jesus died, the apostles could have been found locked inside of their homes behind closed doors. They were scared. You can go back to John chapter 20 and read that sometime if you'd like, but not now, right? They're not scared anymore. When the Holy Spirit comes in power, they're no longer scared, scattered, and skeptical. Instead, they're transformed into one of the most powerful missionary forces that this earth has ever seen. Which brings me to the fourth and fifth words that I would use to summarize the book of Acts so far, and they they really do go together. It's boldness and witness. Boldness and witness. And so Peter, the one who's now the primary spokesman for the apostles, Remember, he's the one who denied Jesus three times when he was arrested. He's now boldly standing up in the synagogue, which is the most public place of the Jewish religious institution. And he's confronting everyone with the gospel message. And he and the rest of the early church, they're not hiding behind closed locked doors anymore. They're meeting publicly to declare, again, the greatness of Jesus. So they're not in hiding any longer. They're out in the open, proclaiming the truth of God. And even though uh, in chapter four, you know, we heard about uh, Peter and John being arrested, you know, they had just healed a man in the name of Jesus and the Jewish relig- religious leaders didn't like that, so they arrested them. Even after that happens, and even after they're told, hey, don't speak of this man or his name any longer, what do they do next after they're released from prison? They pray. And what do they pray for? 
boldness in their witness. And what does God do as a result of their prayer? He answers it. The power of God was poured on them in a new way and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And so what we're seeing is the early church was characterized by unity, by prayer, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and by boldness in their witness. And so that review of Acts really kind of leads us into our first point and our first takeaway from our study together today. We need to appreciate the power and presence of God. We need to appreciate the power and presence of God. You know, since the very beginning of the creation of the world, God has been present and active in it. However, there are certain periods of time where the presence and activity of God have been more tangible to us as humans than others. And the start of the church in Acts is one of those periods of time where God just really clearly makes his presence known. The Holy Spirit's empowering the apostles to perform miracles and to do other mighty signs that confirm God is with them. And we've already talked a bit about, right, the supernatural unity that they had, the power and the boldness that they had that had transformed them because of God's power and presence in them. Well, not only that, but it also changed the way that they thought about their possessions. And so, actually, if you've got your Bibles open, just scoot up a little bit above verse uh, one of chapter five and look at verse 40, four, chapter four, verse 32. This is a passage we actually looked at two weeks ago with Pastor Ryan, and I do think that this is important for us to review again as we head into our study for today of Acts 5. And so listen as I read verses uh, 32 through 37 of chapter four. It says, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Well, as Pastor Ryan mentioned two weeks ago when we looked at this passage, this is a unique time in the church's history. Because of Pentecost, there were literally tens of thousands of people from all over the world gathered in Jerusalem for for that Jewish celebration. And now, many of them have been confronted with the truth of salvation in Jesus alone. And they've converted. And they're staying in the area to learn and to be trained about how to follow Jesus to become disciple makers. And so as we think about this, you know, far removed from those times, this is an amazing time in church history. And Pastor Ryan also pointed out that this passage is not advocating communism. The Bible actually affirms the idea of personal property. And it also affirms the principle of giving generously to meet the needs of others. And so really what we're seeing here is this principle that's at work is everything that we have is God's. Everything we have is God's. Therefore, our question that we need to ask ourselves is, how can I please God with what I have? How can I please God with what I have? Is that a question that you find yourself asking very often? And if not, that's one that I would highly recommend you just kind of ingrain into your brain as you think about going into the new year, right? We're on the cusp of 2018. What do you want that year to be defined by? How about this question? How can I please God by what, with what I have? It's the concept of stewardship. It's the biblical idea that we have been entrusted with God's stuff. It's not our stuff, it's God's stuff. And he expects us to care for it in a way that is consistent with what he wants. And so in any situation that we find ourselves in, we need to be getting into the habit of asking, all right, Lord, how can I please you with what I have in this situation? And then as we study the word, as we seek God's answer out in prayer, then we do it. We live that way. We put it into practice. Ryan also helpfully pointed out that this passage teaches that the sharing here that we're seeing in the early church was based on the needs that were present at that time and that it was also based on the conviction of the Holy Spirit in an individual's life. And we see this most clearly in the positive example of Barnabas in verses 36 and 37. He sells his field, 
And then he gives the money to the church and says, I want you to use this to serve those who have needs. Well, let's take that example and then think about how does that apply to us today? One of the ways that your appreciation for God's power and his presence in your life ought to change you is that you begin to grow in your desire to voluntarily use the gifts, the talents, the abilities that God has given you to meet the needs of others that you see around you. When you see a need in the church, you think, Lord, how can I use what you've given me to please you and to meet that need? Now, I've only been here a couple of weeks, but I've already seen this principle lived out in many of your lives. You know, some of you brought us meals in the first two weeks we were here, settling into our new home. Thank you for that. That was a tremendous blessing to my family. Others volunteered to give of their time to come paint, to come tear up trim, and to just help organize the home. Again, thank you. And still others have been praying for us um, throughout this transition process. And again, we can't thank you enough for that. And then uh, when Deanna Rothwell's aunt passed away this last weekend, her small group rallied around her to bring meal, to help tidy up the home, and, and to ask, are there any other needs that we can meet? That is awesome. Those are all evidences that this church, you guys get this. There are voluntary choices that, where you're demonstrating your appreciation for the power and the presence of God in your lives. I just wanna encourage you, keep that up and praise the Lord for the, what he's already been doing. Now, why would I spend the first chunk of our time this morning reviewing this context for the passage? Well, it's because if you don't understand where we've been, then you're really not gonna understand where we're about to go. You know, I actually, I teased Pastor Ryan a little bit before he left town. I uh, said, hey, you're conveniently leaving town and leaving the new guy to preach on Acts 5. And, and some of you know what comes next in the passage. So uh, for the rest of us, here's kind of a preview, a quick summary of what we're about to study today. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing this spirit-empowered movement in the church. And what we're about to see is that one couple's choice to deceive God and the church, it has some significant consequences. And so what we're looking for today is we're going to learn the importance of viewing sin seriously and then thinking about how do we respond to sin in a way that reveres God, his power and his presence. And so now let's read our primary passage for this morning, uh, Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and he breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Wow, right? I mean, what, what an interesting passage we have to unpack this morning. And as we continue to look at just what's going on in the life of the early church, now we have this fascinating story of a couple who have deceived God and the church, and they receive immediate judgment for it. It leaves us asking, okay, why is this here? Why would God allow it to be in the narrative about the early church at this point in time? You know, what is it teaching us, and how do we respond to it? So those are the sorts of questions that I'm, I'm wanting to answer in the remainder of our time together today. And let's start by answering the question of, well, what is this teaching us? And here's what it's teaching. It's teaching you to recognize the severity of your sin and its consequences. Recognize the severity of your sin and its consequences. And maybe you would say, okay, well, how? How is it teaching us that? 
Well, if you think about it, up until this point in the book of Acts, things have been going in a positive direction, right? I mean, yeah, Peter and John were just arrested, but they were released, and they responded with faith and trust in God in and, and through that. God answered their prayer for more boldness, right? And they continued to witness about him publicly and all of that. And we even just saw in the end of chapter four, right? The church is growing in their voluntary generosity of meeting the needs of others. And so everything seems to be going so well until now. Why? Well, because one couple chose to deliberately sin against God. And let's think about that from another angle. Consider why God would allow this story about Ananias and Sapphira to be written into the canon of scripture for all of history to remember. Think about the progress of Acts maybe in this way. It's like Acts 1 through 4 is when you get into your car for the day, you step on the accelerator and you get up to cruising speed, right? Everything's going well. And then boom, you know, a tire blows. Or maybe more appropriately for this time of year, you hit a patch of ice and you start spinning, right? Now all of a sudden, things aren't so good. We've got a problem. Something terrible is happening. That's what this story is to the early church. It's a wake-up call, and it's one with some very important lessons to learn from. You see, this situation with Ananias and Sapphira, it's a negative example of believers in the early church, while also being a positive example of the holiness of God. And when I say holiness, what I mean is his set-apartness from sin, which may be a made-up word. I don't know if that's a set-apartness is a real word, but his purity, his goodness, that God is perfectly pure, he's perfectly good, and he can't be in the presence of any sin or of any impurity. And so this example is here to reinforce that, the, the concept of his holiness, as well as the power of the Holy Spirit and his presence within the believers and the early church. We also see and learn that God will not be mocked. This actually helps us understand why later in the scriptures, the apostle Paul would write that Christians are called temples of the Holy Spirit. Or the apostle Peter would write that believers are being built up as a spiritual house, as a holy priesthood. You see, the expectation of individual believers and the church, right, which is a gathering of believers, is that we would be growing in holiness, that we'd be growing in purity, that we'd be growing in goodness. Well, why? Because we serve and we worship and represent a holy God. And so how do we do this? How do we grow in holiness? How do we grow in purity? Well, it starts by recognizing the severity of our sin and its consequences. That's the first step. And what's interesting in this particular story is the author, Luke, doesn't seem like to give us a whole lot of details, right? It's a pretty uh, short account of a very significant interaction between this couple and Peter, who was, you know, their pastor, the early leader of the church. So let's just go back over the the details of the story, do a quick review of what we've heard and learned about this couple and about their interaction. So first we see Ananias and Sapphira, they sell a piece of their property, right? They probably saw Barnabas do the same thing, and so that's well and good, no problem there. Then they knowingly keep back some of the proceeds from the sale of that property. Again, not really a problem. This whole command, uh, this whole idea of giving was voluntary. It wasn't a command. It was up to them. Then Ananias brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. And again, so far as we know, not really a problem. Again, it was up to him voluntarily to give as much or as little as he wanted. But then Peter rebukes Ananias for lying to the Holy Spirit. And it's like, okay, wait a minute, big problem. What just happened? And based on what Peter says here in this passage, we can kind of put the pieces back together. While Ananias and Sapphira owned the property, they had every right to use it how they saw fit. But when they brought the proceeds to the church and then they lied about how much they had sold it for, that is now a problem. It would have been no problem for them to say, you know what, we're going to keep this amount and give the rest of the church to meet the needs. Not a problem at all. But they didn't do that. They knowingly misrepresented how much they had sold the property for and then tried to give it to the church. Apparently, they thought that lying would make them look better in the eyes of those around them. So rather than saying something like, hey, uh, just so you know, we kept some of the profit, but here's the rest of it. We want you to use this to meet the needs that you see. Instead, they appeared to say something like this. And again, this is just inference. It's not in the text. But something like, 
hey, uh, we sold this property and here's all of the proceeds from the sale, 100% of it. We didn't keep a single denarii for ourselves. And you can almost hear them saying, aren't we so generous, just like Barnabas? And remember, this, this whole giving was voluntary. It wasn't commanded, wasn't expected of them. It was up to them to give as much or as little as they wanted. And so that's what makes this choice to deceive God and the church all the more grave. They knowingly sinned. They wanted to look good in the eyes of others. But before you go and look down on Ananias and Sapphira, why don't we take that mirror and turn it back around on ourselves first, right? Have you ever been guilty of changing the truth of a story to make yourself look better? Maybe it goes back to like one of the fishing tales, right? Like I caught one six feet long when really it's, well, it's about six inches. Or for anyone who's spent some time around uh, young kids, uh, maybe it goes like this. You know, child one runs up and says, she hit me. I was like, really? She hit you, just completely unprovoked, just straight out knocked you upside the head. Uh, no, not right. one time out of 10 maybe, right? But the shrewd parent knows to ask some follow-up questions. Uh, what happened? Did you do anything that would cause her to hit you? Oh, well, I took her favorite toy that she was playing with. Aha, right? Now we have the whole truth and we know that there's more to the situation. Or how about uh, maybe a disagreement you've had with a spouse, uh, with a coworker, sibling? Have you ever conveniently forgotten some of the details about how that went down so that your side of the story sounded better, right? I think most of us are probably guilty of doing that at some point in our life. And so before we go pointing the fingers at others, let's first point them at ourselves and look at our own life first. Now let's look back at the text here. The consequence of Ananias and Sapphira's sin is obviously very severe. Immediate judgment by God. Um, they both fell over dead, right? And I don't want you to hear me saying this morning that that's how God responds every single time in every single way when someone sins. We know that's not true because otherwise this church house would be very empty this morning, right? No one would be here. We'd all be gone. So we, de- we do need to remember that this is a very unique time in the church's history. When things are just getting started, people are trying to figure out how do we relate to one another and, and more importantly, how do we relate to God as well? And so this situation and the way it played out would have been an invaluable lesson for the early church to recognize sin is serious and the extreme holiness of God is also serious. They would have been reminded that God is not to be mocked or to be taken advantage of and that they are responsible for their choices. Think about what Peter said to Ananias. He calls him out for allowing Satan to fill his heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. But then what does he do? He says, Oh, you're directly responsible as well. He says, why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? So we hear there's no excuse for our sin. We can't blame Satan. And even though the enemy is constantly seeking to tempt us, right? We hear that in scripture. We are the ones who are responsible for resisting that temptation in the power and presence of God. And it is possible. Scripture also tells us that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world but we need to recognize the severity of our sin and the consequences of it. So I have to love you enough this morning to ask you, do you have a high view of sin, of your sin specifically? Do you realize that sin separates you from your holy God, the one who created you? Do you understand that sin is what divides the church because it drives a wedge between brother and sister in Christ? I wanna encourage us, let's not let that happen. Let's seek to change. We must choose to respond appropriately to sin and to God. Respond appropriately to sin and God. And we see this in the way that the early church responds to this situation. Let's look again at Acts verse five and verse 11 here in chapter five. Acts 5, five tells us that when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. They saw what happened and they were greatly afraid. And the same thing in verse 11, after Sapphira has has died, it says, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Now that word there, that word fear, it literally means a reverence or an awe of God. And so they have now seen the holiness of God respond to the sinfulness of man. And they're just awestruck. They're like, oh my goodness, this is a big deal they realize, they're starting to grasp how serious their situation is. 
And the question is, do we grasp how serious our situation is? You know, how often do I or do you sin so casually and then just continue on with our day as if nothing big has happened? I mean, maybe it'd be helpful to take some real-life scenarios here. These may or may not be real-life scenarios from my own life. I'm going to plead the fifth on this and just share them with you. How many of you uh, spent time with family this past week, right? You either traveled to visit them or they came in town to see you. Can I ask you, how did that go? Any opportunities for sin to just kind of squirt out of your heart and your mouth? Maybe you got into an argument with a family member who has a different view of politics than you or of faith than you or even the best kind of dessert, which is obviously chocolate chip cookies. I mean, come on. Um, Or perhaps you snapped at a kid, your own kid or one of your family member's kids because they're just getting in the way. They're being a nuisance. Or maybe you're one of the types of people who just kept it all inside. You didn't say anything, but internally you're just thinking, man, my family is a hot mess. Good thing I've got it all together and can provide some stability to this situation, right? Or maybe you were struggling with selfishness. I really don't want to spend time with these people. Do I have to? And so you were looking for the first chance to escape on your phone, right? And we could go on and on and on with examples. It's honestly scary how easy it is to point out the sin of others, but then ignore our own struggle with sin. And so as the church, guys, we need to be aware of this, that temptation to say, look, I see all of your wrongdoings, but oh, I'm good. I've got my, my act is together. We need more fear of God in our lives. We need to revere him and to see more clearly our own sin. And so that's what I would encourage you to allow this story of Ananias and Sapphira to kindle in you this morning. Allow that holy fear, that reverence, that awe of God to be burning within you that then promotes in you an awareness of and a hatred of your own sin. And then let that ugliness of the sin that you see bring you to a point of brokenness that leads to real life change. Not just emotions, not just crying or feeling guilty over what you've done, but a genuine awareness of your need for forgiveness that then leads you to act. Maybe it's forgiveness from God, obviously, and then maybe it's forgiveness from others too. You go, you confess, right? You ask them to forgive you for that thing, and then you change in the way that you live going forward. And you need to realize that this isn't even possible if you don't first have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. If there's never been a point in your own life where you've come to the conclusion that you need a savior, that you fall short of God's standards, well, then you're never gonna see your daily need to deal with the sin that's in your life in a way that's pleasing to God. So, you know, if if that would describe you this morning, if if you're not sure that you have a personal relationship with Jesus, then I wanna encourage you to take that step today because that is the first step towards heading down a different path than the one that Ananias and Sapphira are on. Because the truth of the matter is, Scripture tells us that our sin does deserve death. We see that in Romans 6, 23, which tells us, for the wages of sin is death. And we're not just talking about physical death here. We're also talking about spiritual death, separation from God. But thankfully, that's not where God stops. He also tells us in Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the good news. That there has been a payment for your sins in the perfect life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the choice is now yours, whether you will agree with God that you're a sinner. And say, yes, Lord, I need you. I need you to save me. Please forgive me. You know, I didn't share with you the end of verse 23. It gets even better. The end of uh, verse 23 says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so that's the hope of a Christian, eternal life with God. And so when you make this decision to follow him, you become a part of the church, which also is described as, I think, a helpful analogy of the family or the body of Christ. And so as the church, we are all in this together. We've got each other's backs. And so Christian brothers and sisters who are here this morning, We have the hope of the forgiveness of our sins, amen? Right, Jesus paid it all. So we need to then pursue the unity of the body. Jesus paid a high price for the unity of his body. And that means we need to deal with our sin quickly and biblically. And we need to deal with the sin that we see present here quickly and biblically. Unfortunately for Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't have a long time to deal with their sin 
But guess what? If you're still here today, then you do have time to deal with your sin. You can choose unity with God and with the church. You can choose to pursue holiness. And so if you have something against a brother or sister in Christ, then I want to encourage you to go and resolve it quickly to protect the church, to show that you revere God and to prevent giving the enemy a foothold. And as we kind of wrap up our time here this morning, I'll just point out that that's exactly why we have one another. God has designed the church to care for itself. And in our church, that's often done in the context of small groups. And so I have to love you enough again to ask you, are you in a small group? Because that's the place where other believers are going to be looking out for you and you, vice versa, get to look out for them. They're going to try to help you identify sin in your life that maybe you're blind to and help you handle it in a way that's pleasing to God. And then again, you get the privilege of doing the same for them. We're in this pursuit of holiness together. You know, I don't know about you guys, but my sin often blinds me. And so I need my spouse or I need you as the church to come alongside of me because you see more clearly into my life than I do. And again, that's how it works vice versa. Our sin blinds us. And so God has graciously given us other believers. He's given us the church to help protect us against the temptations and against the deception of our sin and the enemy. So let's make sure we utilize every resource that God has put on the table for us to follow him and to be bold witnesses in this world. And there's no question about it. You know, I don't know about you. I don't want to go down in the history books like Ananias and Sapphira did. I want to have a different legacy. And so we need to show our appreciation for the power and the presence of God in us and in the church by understanding just how severe our sin is and by responding to it appropriately and to God appropriately. Let's seek to pursue unity and holiness together.